But you may be wondering, how many of you are aware that Adobe actually has analytic solutions? Just a quick raise of hands. How many of you know that we have actually analytic solutions? Okay, I see a hand over there. Um, and that's good to do. That's good uh, that I saw at least one hand. And that's the reason why I inserted these, these slides that you're going to see right here, just to give you a little bit of background and context on Adobe and how, how we actually have analytic solutions. So probably most of you are familiar with, with uh, the, the common Adobe tools like Illustrator, Photoshop, Acrobat, uh, Flash. I mean, those are all tools that, that Adobe's well known for. And in 2009, uh, Adobe made an acquisition of a company called Omniture. Does anybody know about Omniture? Okay, a few more hands go up. So Adobe acquired a basically a web analytics vendor. I was actually a part of that that uh, company, and then since then they've progressively added acquired um, additional companies to build out basically a marketing cloud or a set of a suite of marketing focused uh, tools uh, for for digital marketers. And so it's really that combination of taking the art and the science and the science and bringing them together. So we, uh, as we know, with Adobe, you know, you're using Illustrator, you're using InDesign, you're using all these tools to create something, and then you want to go measure it. And so that's why Adobe felt it was important to make an investment in this. And so these are the last commercial. There's two, two slides. I'm not trying to do a commercial here, but just trying to give you context for why I'm standing in front of you as an evangelist for analytics. So we have our creative cloud, we have our marketing cloud, and then obviously people are creating stuff. They're, they're uploading that to the creative cloud. Then they go over to my world, where I live in, the, the Adobe Marketing Cloud, and you're measuring those campaigns, measuring those websites, measuring those mobile apps, measuring all of the stuff you're creating, and then optimizing, testing, behavioral testing. Um, we've got a content management system, so you're, you're testing all of this stuff, and it's, it's all coming together. These are the, the six solutions, and I'm, I'm a member of the, 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 the group there, the Adobe Analytics. And so as an evangelist, I'm part product management slash um, technical marketer. So that's enough of the commercial. Don't see any more Adobe stuff. I'm not, not here to sell. I'm here to talk about best practices. And uh, one of the things that, the title of this, I said, forget about data scientists. You know, we, we need more action, analytics action heroes. And so I'm going to talk today about how we can get more analytics action heroes. Now, this came out in, in the Harvard Business Review, and they talked about it being the sexiest job of the 21st century. And, and so automatically I thought of you know a lot of popularity around Sherlock, if you haven't seen the show, excellent show. Benedict Cumberland, or uh, Cumberland, um, Batch. Batch. I know that, yeah. <laughs> so he's uh, definitely very popular right now. And there's a, there's a study that, uh, so just imagine these companies, you know, you're trying to find the Sherlock Holmes, you know, it's, it's kind of like this unicorn. You know, where they have all these very particular skills, very hard, you know, you're competing with lots of different companies to find these, these magical unicorns known as data scientists. And not only are they magical, but we need 190,000 of them um, before 2018. And so that's, that's a big challenge. And, and you know, that, that represents a lot of people that we need. But the other statistic that doesn't get mentioned as much from this report is the fact that we also need 1.5 million <coughs> managers and analysts to go along with that, that are data savvy. And so I'm here today to say that, you know, we need more analytics action heroes that's both gonna come from the data scientists, because I don't, I don't believe that data scientists naturally are action, action, analytics action heroes, but we're gonna get a lot of analytics action heroes on this right side here as well. So if we look at data scientists, you know, obviously, People have different definitions. This is my definition. I think it's more or less aligned with kind of the you know the perception out there that you know they're going to have a master's or some kind of advanced degree. One of those fields they, they probably undergrad in computer science. You know they can they, they know machine learning. They know statistics. They, they they're going to build algorithms and models and and they know some of those tools down there. Now the analytics action heroes they're slightly different and and they can actually be data scientists as well, but probably college degree, maybe an MBA. You know, they're an analyst or a business manager within an organization. They're, they're data savvy. They're data driven. You know, they, they look at the data first before they make any decisions. And they're familiar with maybe, maybe they're not programming in R, but they are familiar with Excel. They are using Tableau. They are using maybe an analytics tool like what, a, what Adobe offers. 
And so if we look at data scientists, you know, typically from what I've seen is, you know, there's a group of, you know, the companies that were lucky enough to find some of these unicorns, they have them in a the little group and they interact with maybe the CEO or the management team. And that's about the extent of their part of the, the organization. They're not throughout the whole organization like the analytics action heroes. Analytics action heroes are dealing with some of the tactical things, but because they're distributed around the organization, and if you had an organization that actually had some of these action heroes, you're gonna see a lot of value from that, not just isolated in that one pocket of data scientists. So I come from the world of marketing, okay? And uh, digital marketing particularly, so all of the, as I mentioned in the beginning, Adobe has tools that enable us to measure and optimize um, the marketing that we, that we do, um, the companies are doing. And I worked eight years as a consultant, so I worked with a lot of Fortune 500 companies, working with them on their analytics, their digital analytics, their web analytics, measuring all of the websites and, and, and working with them uh, before I came over into this role that I'm in now. And if you're aware of marketing, one of the key things, one of the quotes that's been very popular is this quote from John Wanamaker. And he was a retail pioneer. He's one of the first retailers to advertise in newspapers. And he had this statement, and people, you know, marketing kind of laugh, ha, 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 you know, we don't know which half. But today, that is not the case. Today, marketers actually can know what is effective and what isn't effective. And so we need to abandon and move beyond that quote. And what happened, it was interesting, I was, uh, I was in the session that, um, that uh, Matthew Alexander, if any of you went to the Disney session, he was talking about in 2008 how hard it was um, for a lot of organizations like Disney and others at this time. And, and marketing became, it came under scrutiny. And the old way of marketing was, I've got a hunch, I've got an instinct, I'm gonna go with that, you know, and I'm gonna go with those, those kind of gut decisions. And that's, that's the way we operated until about 2000, 2008, 2007, 2008. And then all of a sudden I started to see this trend here of the data-driven marketer coming into the, into the world and actually saying, you know what, we get some data. We don't have to make risks with our budget. We don't have to make the wrong, you know, an uneducated um, decision. We can actually use the data to make smarter decisions. And so there was a, a, a study that, that came out from the Columbia Business School and the NYAMA, and it was a couple years ago, but the, some of the insights were that 91% of senior corporate marketers believe that they should be using customer data. <coughs> and if you look behind that number, 100% of the C-level executives were saying, yes, we should be using data to, to, to control our decisions. But when it came to walking the talk, probably like a lot of organizations, you know, we, oh yes, we believe in big data, we believe in analytics, uh, but, but when we actually get down to the nitty gritty, it's not happening. And in this case, 57% were not basing their market budgets, marketing budgets on ROI analysis. They're basing on historical spending patterns and also that gut instinct. Same study, 36% report that they, they have lots of customer data but they don't know what to do with it. And then also 39% of marketers say they couldn't turn their data into actual insights. And that's really, concerning, you know, that we can't take all this data that we're using and actually put it to good use. And so uh, this, when I, this is about a couple years ago, and I started writing a book, and I thought, okay, how do we turn this around? How do we, how do we kind of push people along? How can we get more people using the data? What do we as analysts need to do to help organizations kind of turn that corner? And so who's gonna rescue marketing, and maybe other organizations, this analytics action hero, okay? And so I'm gonna outline for you today how you can be an analytics action hero. I'm gonna take some of the concepts from my book and share it with you today. So when I think of analytics action hero, and I grew up in the 80s, and I grew up on Indiana Jones, you know, and I admired the, the tenacity of Indiana Jones. I mean, think of it, you know, he's like chasing these guys, these Nazis, you know, and he's got dragged behind the, the, the truck, and then he's going through the windshield. I mean, he never gives up, he keeps going. You know, and he's curious. He's keep going to all these digs and different places to find things. And so there's that natural curiosity. And then you have Sherlock Holmes. Love Sherlock Holmes, you know, and, and very intellectual, very scientific, you know, hypothesizing about what's going on and, and really using his intellect to, to find, uh, you know, what's, determine what's, what's happening with the data. And then there's MacGyver. MacGyver's magical too, because, you know, as we know with analytics, the data isn't always perfect. 
it isn't, doesn't come served serve to us on a silver platter that we, we then just consume as we wish. No, sometimes there's bugs in it, sometimes there's things that are missing, and so we have to you know, use a little bit of that duct tape to bring it all together. And then lastly, a little bit of Bruce Lee um, the gas uh, buildings there. But at the end of the day, what an action hero is doing is trying to drive value. And, and th there's three factors that I found that I highlight in my book um, that are really important to being an action hero. The first is ability, and I'll get into that briefly, what I think are some of the, the attributes of being an action hero. Then the environment, and I'll, I'll give you a story about why that's important. And then I'll talk about the approach that I believe um, people, and, I, and I've seen this applied in, in my arena of web analytics or digital analytics, but I've seen it used actually in other, people have taken my book or the concepts from my book and used it in other, other uh, venues and other uh, situations. So when I would, I've, I had the opportunity of working at Adobe or Omniture at a time when uh, I was in consulting and I was hiring a lot of people. I hired probably over a hundred different consultants. And so I was interviewing a lot of people and I started to find some key areas that really mattered to being a digital analytics <coughs> expert. And, and so I'll go through some of these. You, obviously, I think this will this will carry over into other areas and other other fields. Um, but it comes down to first business acumen. So you're looking for somebody who has business acumen. They they understand the domain that they're analyzing. I think that's really important because you can miss things if you're if you're isolated from that and don't understand really what you're you're analyzing. So a lot of times, because again, this is digital marketing, I would try and interview people who are marketers because then they can think like their customers. They can think like uh, they can understand the challenges of their customers and how they're trying to, to help them. Um, being customer centric, having that marketing acumen was really important. Analytical skills. You know, at the end of the day, if they don't have the, the raw horsepower of intelligence, if they're not curious, I like curious people. I, I would ask um, I would ask in interviews, you know, what have you what kind of analysis have you done? A lot of times we're interviewing people maybe coming straight out of college but you'd start to get a sense for how curious they were through some of the projects they did, some of the, the side projects that they did. Uh, Detail-oriented, obviously very important, being open-minded, objective, problem-solving, and then tool mastery. That's probably one of the least important skills, not because it's not important to the job, but because I can teach you that. I can't teach you intelligence. I can't teach you curiosity. Um, communication skills and interpersonal skills, huge. Super important. That's one of the things I've read a lot of analytics books, and one of the things I felt was really important to highlight is that how important the soft skills are. And you'll see that in some of the, the tips and present practices that I share with you. Obviously, knowing the domain, so the world that I'm in, digital uh, marketing, so websites, business models, um, technology, online trends, but convey, bring that over to your world. You know, if you're, if you're looking at online donors or academic donors, you know, what are the things that they need to know about that space? A lot of this stuff can be taught. That's the great thing about it. And then I, I had a special character or category here, which I call the hero factor. And so they, these are factors that I found, you know, if I was looking at consultants and then our lead consultants. And some of these factors were just a passion. They have a passion for what they're doing. If, and, and I saw this not just in our consultants, but also in clients. If there's a passion about what they're doing, <coughs> exploring the data, turning over your new rocks, um, being proactive rather than being, being reactive all the time. I mean, in analytics, you can be very reactive. You can sit back and wait for these questions to come to you, or you can be lean in a little bit and anticipate what questions you know, we need to be asking and start asking them. Confidence, relentless, resourceful, again, that MacGyver, those are all characteristics that are really important. Now, that's not just it. That's, you know, one thing is to have the ability the next thing is the environment. And so I'm going to share with you a story of a friend of mine, um, Peter. He, he worked in web analytics, worked at a number of, of big companies, and, and had, had a very successful career. And he actually came over and joined the consulting team that I was on. And then he got offered his dream job. And basically a chief uh, marketing officer at a, at a large financial organization came to him and said, I'm building the dream team. I'm building the digital analytics dream team, and I want you to be a part of it. And he got excited, and he, he left um, the consulting team that I was on and joined this opportunity. And it was great for the first few months, until six months later, he was on the street. Why was he on the street? Well, what happened was three months into his job, 
that CMO, that chief marketing officer that he was working with, quit. All of a sudden, all of support, all of the executive support he had to drive these initiatives, all of the strategy plans they had, completely fell apart. All of a sudden, all of the old executives that had certain tendencies and things started, yeah, yeah, I know we were going to do that, but let's just do it this way. And, and he was putting in 12, 16 hours a day, could not turn it around and realized, you know what, there's no, um, no way of making this work. Now, he had the ability, and I'm pretty sure he had the approach, because he was successful at other organizations, but he didn't have the environment. And so, you know, for planning a garden for your analytics team, or as analysts, I mean, you can either look at it from your perspective, what kind of environment am I operating in? Is it a desert, or is it a garden? And, or as an executive, what kind of an analytics environment am I creating for my analytics team? Is it a desert or is it a, is it a lush garden? So some of the key things that I've seen, one is having an executive sponsor. This is, this is pass-fail for a lot of analytics programs that I've worked with. If you don't have that executive support, very, very hard to, to get anywhere. You be the sharpest analyst in the world, but you know, a lot of times there's, there's politics and, and resources and budgets that are out of your control. And you really need that executive sponsor to help you prioritize and know what to focus on. Strategy, what I, what I mean by strategy is um, clarity around what the strategy is. So obviously you can have an analytic strategy. But what I'm talking about here is I've gone into companies and I've sat down one company, I remember as I sat down in this room and it was all these product managers from this large, um, Fortune 500 company, and we were. I was trying to understand what we needed to measure because we were going to we were going to collect the data that they needed on their websites and, and give that to them in reports and, and different things. And uh, you know, I was struggling to kind of get a consensus of what they were really tasked to really measure. And at the end of the presentation or at the end of this meeting, one of the product managers piped up, and there's about. 15 or 20 in the room said, Brent, when you talk to the senior leaders, could you please let us know what our strategy is online? And so that can be a huge impediment. And a lot of companies run into problems with that, and I'll, I'll get into that in a little bit. Staffing is a big problem. If you're the one guy or the one gal at a company supporting hundreds or thousands of users, it can be very hard to do the really value-add work that you need to do. Training is important too, obviously with analytics tools. If you have a fully trained, um, uh, you know, all, of the, all of the people in the organization are trained on the tools, that means less dependency on the analyst. I am now freed up to do more things that are more strategic rather than, yes, what you do, okay, you lost your password to the, okay, let me set you up with that username, okay, here's your password. I mean, I mean that's a very low level example, but that can happen. Uh, the data, at the end of the day, I'm dependent upon the data and the quality of the data. And if that is not uh, working, then I'm in trouble. The tools that I'm using are very important. I need to have the right tools. And at the end of the day, I always throw this on here, accountability. How many organizations are really building accountability on the metrics into their, into their culture, into their system? A lot of companies want to have the data. They want to measure things, but they're not um, holding the organization accountable. And it's not, it's not to punish people, um, but it's really to create an environment of learning. You know, if we're not learning from the mistakes we're making, we're not going to get better off in the future. Okay, so now covered the, the two quick elements here. Now I want to dive deep into the approach. Okay, so I'm going to start with a story here. And uh, it was very uh, apropos that uh, we have Disney here. So one of the things my family loves to do is take trips to Disneyland. And so I actually have five kids. We had twins in our last try, so I never planned on having five kids, but we did. <laughs> Um, I'm originally from up north there, uh, Vancouver, and we relocated to Utah. Now, traveling from, from Salt Lake to uh, Los Angeles or Anaheim, that's a 10-hour drive, okay? And, and we stop, we obviously we don't stop too long in those days. It's, you know, it's not really kid-friendly. So we, we go through there, so we get six hours to Vegas and then four hours to uh, Anaheim. And there's a lot of planning goes into this. You know, and my wife is on top of everything. I'm kind of a space cadet when it comes to planning this kind of stuff, especially thinking beyond myself. Um, so my wife is very prepared. And when we get we get to Anaheim, we check into the hotel, and the kids are like, you know, if you've ever gone to Disneyland, you know, or told your kids you're taking them to Disneyland, they start getting excited. 
And the first thing you do is you start, you, you drive into Anaheim, right, and you start to see the parking lots. And the parking lots aren't just parking lot A or parking lot B. No, we're talking Woody parking lot or Pumbo parking lot. You know, so the kids are trying to see the characters, they're trying to get excited. And then the shuttle comes, this is the old shuttle, the new shuttle, our space buses now with the, the decals on the side. But they're starting to see the characters, they're starting to get really pumped up now. And then you start, okay, we're almost there, we have to go to the security area. And then we get into the middle, and then we're deciding between, you know, good and, and awesome, you know, it's, it's like California Adventure Park or Disneyland. Now, what if I was a father and I said, okay, okay, kids, back to the car, back to the hotel, we'll come back tomorrow, and we'll do the same thing over and over and over. And this is actually what companies are doing that I've seen on a repeat basis. And there's actually two lanes that I would say in analytics. There's action land and there's setup land okay so setup land is the parking lot of analytics action land is what we do with the insights that we get do, do we optimize our, our campaigns do we optimize our website do we optimize our applications do we do anything with it but what happens is i think a lot of companies and i've seen this they get stuck in setup land basically outside of the thing part not not actually ever going in and so there's actually three steps to this. Um, there's the align part. So this is understanding the strategy or the business goals of the organization. And then saying, okay, we're gonna align, we're gonna measure based on what's important to the business. And then we actually get the tags, in this case on a website, we start collecting the data. So we're, we're measuring the data. And then we report, you know, so we got all this data. We, we turn into information and we then start sharing with the organization. And what happens though, is that that cycle starts to repeat. And they start to go back. Okay, well, can I have a report this way? Can I have a report that way? Oh, let's, let's collect more data. You know, we have a new website coming. And so they get stuck in this cycle and never actually breaking through to action. And so the, my key to getting into action land is analysis. And the reason that I feel that this is important is we actually Set aside, now I'm not saying that setup land is not important, it is. But let's be efficient through that process and let's get into, let's see if we can spend more time doing what's really valuable to the business, which is actually doing that analysis which is gonna drive optimizations. <coughs> so another way to look at this is, there's a number of dominoes that we need to knock over to get the value from our analytics investment. So value is that last domino. And there's certain things we need to set up and knock down to make sure we hit that domino. If I take out one of these dominoes, like the analysis, all of a sudden, okay, I have data and I have reporting, but I would argue reporting is actually minimal value and probably not going to drive any value uh, unless we're doing analysis based on those reports. Then we need to knock over the decision domino, right? And then we have to make sure that the teams that are executing on the decision are actually executing well and, and understand the importance of executing. So I want to move from being reporting robots, that I think a lot of analysts are more like reporting robots, and let's turn let's turn them into at, uh, analytics action heroes. So here, this, this is the framework that I want to share with you. Okay, so on one side, we have time. Time is finite. At the end of the day, I have 40 hours, you know, if I'm working overtime, maybe 60, 80 hours a week that I can invest in analyzing stuff, okay? So I need to be efficient on that side. On the other side, I want to drive, if, if I'm doing the analysis, I want to make sure that I'm driving an impact. I want to have an impact on the business. If I'm investing all this time, I want to make sure that something has happened based on what I'm doing. And so I need to be effective. And so there's basically four, three steps that, I, that I've identified that help us to be um, effective, and, and, and this is kind of the action hero framework. So one is to prioritize, and I'll get into each of these areas. Second is to analyze. So let me back up. Prioritize, so that's understanding where should I focus my time? How can I be efficient with my time as an analyst and get the most bang for the buck? Next is being systematic and scientific in how I do my analysis. So I'm gonna propose an approach, but as long as you have an approach and you're systematic in how you use your time in doing analysis, you can be effective in that area. And then lastly, at the end of the day, I can have a PhD in statistics. I could be one of those data scientists, you know, and, and have all the, the fancy degrees and everything, 
But if I cannot communicate, if I cannot rally people around my ideas, I will fail. Um, I will not drive any value. Okay, so prioritize for, an, for an impact. And I put that in at the last second and it's still there. Pretend that pause button is not there. <laughs> That's what you do when you think, oh, that would be good to just do this. Okay. Um, so for, there's five key steps here. So as an analyst, the first thing that I need to look at is business goals. And I think this applies to big data, this applies to anything. If I understand what the business is trying to achieve, what is important, and even prioritizing those, those, those business objectives. Because at the end of the day, you know, not all business objectives are equal. Some are more important than others. And so that gives, that's my first lens that I look at. The next thing I look at is my ability to influence. And this probably goes back to, at the end of the day, I have to be efficient. If I can't influence something, I'm probably not gonna, I'm not, you know, my time is finite, I'm not gonna waste time on something I can't influence. So I'm gonna hit the pause button now, and I'm gonna take you over to this. So what are some of the common action roadblocks? And the, the reason why I'm thinking about this now is because, you know, I could think about this after I found the insight, but if I think, think about it after I found the insight, then it's already too late. I've already wasted the time analyzing something, and there's a good chance that nobody's gonna act on it. So there, there's a risk there. So I'm, I'm asking analysts to think about this beforehand and, and see if there's, you want to go where there's, a, I guess, the path of least resistance, but understand if there is a roadblock, you're going to have a bigger challenge, and so you might have to invest more time. So the first one is relationships. So an example here would be, if I find an interesting insight, but it's actually for another group outside of my group, that may not, they may not want to hear from me, because I'm in a, a different group or organization, and, and an analyst shared this with me, where, where they actually found some interesting insights for this other business unit. And the business unit, they knew that because of the work structure, if they came to them with any recommendations or insights, they weren't going to listen. Because it was, you know, not from, oh, that's from, you know, outside of the organization, that's not, you're not part of our work, therefore, you know, that's great, but we're, we're just going to ignore it, you know. And so he actually said, okay, we're not going to, we're not going to go there. But later there was a re-arc. That team actually came in. They were able to go and do the analysis, share the insights, do the optimization. So there have to be relationships, and those could be relationships that you're fostering. There could be relationships between work structures. But you have to think about, you know, is there a roadblock there for, for taking action on it just simply because of these, these personal, interpersonal connections or structures that we have? There's also opinions. People have very strong opinions of things. And, and so if you're going in and you're basically maybe taking one of those sacred cows of, of an organization, they have a certain belief or best practice and you're gonna take it down at the knees because you found some analysis or you, you feel like there could be an opportunity here, just be prepared that they may not listen to you, they may have strong opinions and, and the rigor that you may need to go against those opinions might be challenging. The other thing is operationally, so there might be some times where I've worked with different companies where a team has asked me to do an analysis and I know that they have no budget to implement what I, if I came back with a recommendation, they have no budget to implement it. Again, that's a situation where it does not make sense. I'd love to help them, but I can't because my time is precious and if they can't act on it, then I'm not gonna see any value. And then the other thing is timing. So there might be an opportunity that I've found and if I pursue it, could we actually implement it? Could we actually get it in time? Could we act on it in a timely fashion to actually take advantage of it? There might be too short a window where it's like, I can't actually go after the opportunity because the window's closing in a week, and I know that our IT team typically updates their site every two weeks. We just missed the window. It's dead. So understanding some of these are operational, some of these are interpersonal. Obviously, the executive sponsor can help with some of these things and kind of push out some of these roadblocks. Um, but these are important things to think about as we look at our ability to influence. The next thing is looking at the potential impact. So looking at a dollar value. How much impact will this have on the business? And then the level of effort. It could take me, I could see a, a million, dollar, million dollar potential opportunity, but it could take me thousands of hours to analyze and to get to, the, to that big insight. Or maybe I go for that, that uh, one base or two base hit and you know, maybe it's 100 grand or 200 grand, but it takes me five hours, 10 hours. I mean, maybe I do those all day long and I'm generating more than a million of value. 
The last thing is context. And so these things are constantly shifting. If I have a new CMO or a new leader, all of a sudden the business goals can change. I've seen that at companies where a new person comes in, they're changing the strategy, all of a sudden something, a metric that was important or a KPI was important, now isn't important. So I as an analyst need to adjust to that. Also, maybe, it, uh, maybe the vendor that I'm using for my analytics introduces a new feature where previously manually it took forever to do that kind of analysis and because it took so long, I never considered it as viable. But now because the tool makes it easy to do it, all of a sudden, oh, that difficult analysis is now easy. I can now do it. And so I'm constantly weighing um, the opportunities that I have in front of me to, to use my time effectively. So what's keeping my, your CXO awake at night? And I think this is really important to think, you know, in terms of going back to those business objectives, if I can really understand what's important to the business, what's keeping them awake at night, um, that's, that's going to be really important to me, and I'm going to focus there. And so when you think of strategy, I, I break it up into three areas, and I break it up into scope. And so um, you'll see a map in the background here. So scope is like, okay, well, let's say it's, east side of the city. I want to focus on some, doing something on the east side of the city. So where, okay? And then the goal is I want to have fun with my family, okay? So that's the goal. That's what I want to achieve, and that's the what. And then the initiatives, that's kind of the how. How am I going to do that? Well, we're going to take a picnic, and we're going to go rollerblading with the kids at the park. So we're going to achieve that goal of having fun, and, and that's how we're going to do it at a high level. And then we get into the tactics. Okay, well, what do the kids have to pack? Uh, what are the foods we're going to need to tell okay, Well, Josh doesn't like that, so we're going to have to take, you know, we get into the low-level details. And the strategy is really what's important to analytics. Understanding the measurement, what we're trying to drive. Tactics sometimes get in the way, and we have to be careful to kind of keep those separate. Um, and th there's problems that can happen with this, and I've seen this at different companies. This is what, uh, something, has anybody heard of the air sandwich? No? Okay. So this is a book uh, by Nilfer Merchant called The New How. And she talks about something that she saw in working with different te uh, technology companies. And she saw that there's, at these companies they would have a vision that's provided by the senior managers. Okay, so they provide the vision. This is how we're gonna you know, be the best company in the next two years. And then the execution level, that's you know, for all the rest of the employees. Okay, the day-to-day -day tasks of what I'm doing and getting done. And then here's the air sandwich. It's the, it's the disconnect between the how and the what to focus on. And, and she talks about this, um, I, I translate this into having a digital measurement strategy. But what that means is basically getting these two teams to talk and filling in that, that, that gap that we have. So executives, they may not have all the full context of how we're gonna achieve things that the line or the low level people have. And so what I've done with different companies, because I run into this challenge of you know, product management teams not knowing the strategy, is helping them to define what they're gonna measure, understand which of the, prioritizing with these different business objectives, and trying to get into the detail around how we're gonna fill that sandwich, and, and getting the, you know, the, the good parts of the sandwich in there. So as an analyst, we need to own the context wheel, and there's five different ways we can do that. So one, as an analyst, I need to be plugged into the tribal knowledge of my company. I need to know, you know, again, looking from a digital analytics perspective, I need to know when the website's down. I need to know when we're launching new campaigns. I need to know when we're doing certain things that our company is across that could impact parts of my world or parts of my internal customer's world. I need to know what's going on. From an industry perspective, I need to know what some of the trends are happening out in the industry. I need to know what my customers' interests and beliefs and how those are changing and, and, and their demographics. I need to keep on top of that. I need to know from a competitor perspective, what are they doing with their products? What are they doing with their campaigns? How is that impacting us? And then from an analytics per platform perspective, I need to know the tool and how we're collecting and measuring the data. And I need to bring that all together because context is really powerful as an analyst. So, Getting into analyze parts, so we need to be efficient and, and effective. I propose a heroic analysis approach. And so first is having a head list. And so what I'll do is I'll go through and I'll say, I understand the business objectives. I'm trying to you know, look at a particular part here. And so I'm going to generate a head list of different dimensions or different reports that I'm going to look at. And so I'll go through that head list. 
then I'll evaluate the data in this context. So that's kind of doing the pre-work to understand is the data valid? Is there any issues with the data? Before I start trusting the data with my analysis, I want to make sure that it's valid. And then I want to get that external context I talked about, see if there's anything going on that could impact the particular analysis I'm doing. Then I start doing that exploratory, going across all of the hit list and, and identifying you know, what are the things that, that, that could, be stand, could stand out. And then going in deeper as necessary, digging in several layers. And then inspecting the monetary value. And I'll get into that a little bit, why that's important. And then recommending which of those options that I've found is actually you know, coming back with a recommendation based on the monetary value. Now money is really important, um, especially, you know, I, I think in, in any kind of analysis you're doing, because it's the so what, you know, why should I care? It's, it's the current, you know, it's the language that we can speak with business users that enables them to connect with us and understand. And let me give you an example of that. So I may have done an analysis of an online check-in pro check process for an airline. And I found that only 5.3% of online customers are using it. And I could say to my manager, this is really bad, we need to fix this. Okay. Or B, I could actually extrapolate out based on the lower usage of the check-in process and the money that we save if they use, did use it, all of a sudden I can go to my manager and say, $16.8 million, if we can just fix this problem, we can, we can generate, you know, we can save an additional $16.8 million. All of a sudden she's running with me to her manager's office with this opportunity. And so it's just a way we communicate and if we can monetize it, we should. So mobilizing for success. So resistant comes in different forms. So you might have an audience where I just don't get what you're sharing with me. Okay? Or you might get, I don't like what you're sharing with me. I understand it perfectly, but I don't like what you're sharing. Or I like what you're sharing, but I don't trust it. Or I don't trust you because you haven't built a relationship with me. And so you know, there's different kinds of resistance and, and there's ways for removing resistance. So one is obviously knowing your audience, knowing, you know, what are, what are the, do they have problems with the data? Do they have problems with uh, understanding um, the problem? Yeah. What are their priorities? What's important to them? You know, what, should, should I even bring up something that's not critical to them? Maybe not. Um, so I'm, I'm getting, I'm building a relationship with them. I'm understanding what their needs are. Then I create a message around the problem. Obviously, uh, we'll get into some of that, but storytelling obviously is really important. How we tell a story with the data that we, we capture, and, and we want to nail that message. And then we could say, okay, our work's done. We've built a relationship with the audience. We've delivered the, the insight. Okay, there, you know, go forth and do what you need to do with that data. Uh, but no, we actually have to stay the course. We may need to talk to the implementation team, so maybe there's a problem with the website. We need to go beyond just the, the influencers and, and actually go talk to the IT team that's responsible for fixing that. Because they may have other priorities and they don't understand that this is a big problem and that they need to actually action it. And, and so I need this now, so I need to carry it through until we actually get the, get the opportunity there. And then also it's about closing the loop. So if I want to build a relationship with people internally, I want to come back to them and say, hey, I said this was a $2 million opportunity. I was slightly off. It was only a $1.8 million opportunity. Or, hey, guess what? It was a $4 million opportunity. Yay. But that's a part of that coming back around to the stakeholders and giving them um, something. Now, who's, who's heard of the curse of knowledge? Who's read uh, Made, Made Stick? <laughs> okay, Made Stick, awesome book. Um, awesome book. And in this, in this um, study they did, they, they talked about a, a study at Stanford. And at Stanford, they had two groups of, of uh, students, and they divided it up into two groups. One was a control group, one was the tappers. Okay, and so what the, the tappers would do is they would be told different, um, you know, common, well-known kind of music, you know, like maybe like, Happy Birthday to Me, or um, Star Spangled Brand, or Star, here I am, Canadian, Canada, Canadian here. <laughs> Um, but the um, American Anthem, and, and they, they would say, Could, if you hum this to these people, how often do you think they would guess that tune? And so the people were like, the tappers were like, oh, I think 50% of the time, I think they would get it. So I'm, I'm pretty confident that they could do it. Well, in actuality, the listeners could only guess 2.5% of the time. And the reason for this was because the tappers had the tune in their head. 
They're just tapping along with the tune that's in your head. Whereas the, the listeners were, ah, I just hearing random taps. I have no tune in my head. And the reason why I bring this up is important is because as analysts or analytics professionals, we can, we're consuming the data all day long. We are in the reports. We have full context for what's going on. We, you know, we've done hundreds of analyses. We, you know, we, we understand everything that's going on. And sometimes that can get in the way of us, how we communicate. Because we, it's hard to think about what people, you know, can I, can I anticipate what people don't, what is it like to not know what I already know? That's a hard thing to do. And so that's one of the challenges that we as, as analytics professionals have to overcome. And so we have to take the data that we have and we have to tell a story with it. And so that we can then, you know, if we bring in enough context and think in, in terms of, of what people don't know about um, the data and giving them enough and bringing it together so we can tell a compelling story. Now, this is actually a quote um, from the same authors of that book um, that I really like, but it's really about taking the summaries of data that we have and pulling out a story or two. And there's, there's a couple ways that you can do this. So one, and I know this I, as I've been going to some of these comp, uh, some of these sessions and, and hearing about obviously a large, many of you are probably looking at donors and 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 it's really about that journey that they go through. They're not customers. It'd be the donor journey. In the web analytics world, it's about understanding the the journey of our customers. And I can build a story about these people. I don't have to take numbers and say, well, you know, 30% of the of the um, the user is using a uh, Safari browser, struggle on this way. I can, I can talk about Matt. And Matt is a, he, he's a Mac user, he's a designer, and he, had, he has his uh, MacBook Pro, and he comes to our site, and look at these pages. He's going, he's interacting with this one page here, and he runs into this problem where he can't fill out a certain field. And I can tell a story about Matt instead of <coughs> Safari users, 30% are banning, you know. It's kind of dry, but I can do that with the customer journey. I think you guys can do that as well from a donor, a donor perspective. The other one that I really like is the analogy. And I'll give you a story about an analyst that he shared this with me. He worked at a financial services organization. And at this, it was an Italian bank, and they promoted from within. So a lot of the people um, that went up throughout the organization started in the bank as a bank teller or as a bank manager. Or, um, and so they all worked in the physical stores. And he had a hard time communicating with them because they weren't traditional online marketers. They didn't really get the online world. They would try and replicate a lot of the experience, the offline experience, online. And so anyways, he was having a hard time explaining to them that when they were trying to get this new person to sign up on an account, they'd come into this page and they'd have all these links, all these different links that they take up, you know, it's kind of like the the display at the front of the bank where you have all these flyers, you know, where you can just pull out all these different services. And so all these customers are coming into the landing page and then seeing all these links, oh, I'll just go here. But they weren't converting. They weren't actually signing up for that new account. And he was trying to explain, he was showing the visualizations, he was talking about the data, and it just wasn't connected with his audience. So then he said, okay. He turned off his PowerPoint, he stepped away, and he said, okay, how many of you shop at a big box retailer? Okay, so like a Best Buy. And they all raised their hands and they said, okay, here's the scenario. You're going in to buy a Blu-ray player. You go into the store, you find the Blu-ray, you know, it's kind of big, but you find the Blu-ray section, and all of, a, all of a sudden a sales guy comes over to you and says, hey, hey, oh, you made it to Best Buy. Hey, come over here. Come over here. Hey, I want to show you our, our high-definition TVs. Come on, look, oh, I mean, it's great. You know, look at the features and you've got the smart TV and it's all, you know, Wi-Fi based. Okay, we'll see you later. And then they would be abandoned by the HTTVs. And then they're like, well, how do we get here? How do we get, where were the blue ray? Oh, let's just go. When he explained it with an analogy, taking the same scenario, but in terms of what they could comprehend, all of a sudden it clicked for these, these uh, bankers. And they were like, oh, okay, I get it now. I understand the problem. So he went back to his data visualizations and walked through it, and then they made the, made the changes. So there's some ways that we as analysts can, can trip up ourselves. We can derail our own presentations um, and how we are our storytelling. So one is, you know, I've mentioned this several times, not knowing your audience and their priorities. So we're already missing the mark if we're out of the gate, they don't care about what we're presenting. Uh, we use unfamiliar analytics jargon, right? We're not talking in terms of the terms that they use, we're using conversion rates, or we're using page views, or 
we're using sessions. And maybe things, terms, there, there may be familiar terms that they're comfortable with, and then there may be others that are not. So we need to watch our vocabulary. Providing too much detail. So we, we just, we, you know, we take all of the data exploration we do, and then we just kind of dump it on them. We're not handpicking out what would be really essential to them to understand the problem and take action on it. So we also substantiate everything. You know, we feel like, oh, we're going to be tested on anything. You know, where did that data come from? Okay. We're experts. We should be able to respond to that if needed. Maybe put that in a parking lot, but it shouldn't have, we shouldn't have to substantiate everything as we're presenting a business problem. Explaining your analytic process or steps is like showing our work, right? So we did, first I looked at this and there was nothing there. Then I went over here and then I, what I did is I did a linear regression and then I found that the R's, you know, no. Just get to the point. What is, what is important to the, the business user to really take advantage of this? And, and, and they don't need to see your work. They just need to know, okay, I need to make a decision on what. Can you, can you jump to your point? Leaving up valuable context, again, that's the, that's the point about what I said with uh, first of knowledge. We actually eliminate something that we thought was irrelevant, but we're not aware that the audience didn't know that. They, they weren't aware of that uh, piece of context. Talking too much and not allowing for discussion. How many of you have seen this happen? I had a friend. He presented an awesome analysis. Took the full. He had, he had stakeholders from different parts of the organization. All came into the meeting room. He had them for 45 minutes. And he had scheduled 45 minutes. And he spoke for 45 minutes. And then he got to the end. And then he's like, okay, so now, and everybody's getting up and leaving. And I think I've seen, I've seen this not just from him, but I've seen this from other analysts is that we need to leave time to discuss the next steps. We need to leave time for people to come together and discuss, because maybe half your audience agrees with your point, the other half don't. And they need to come to a, a kind of a resolution. Yes, we're gonna act on this or no, or we're gonna do deeper analysis, we're gonna get, so you come out of that meeting with clarity instead of, okay, I'm gonna have to schedule another meeting and then I'm gonna have to rehash this, and I might not be able to get everybody in the room at the same time again. So the last, last point I wanna make here is, it's one thing to be data driven, but we also need to be action agile. And what I mean by that is if you look at these two cars on the surface, they're both very high powered, they're data driven. But if we look at their ability to act on those insights, the one on the right can actually take advantage of the insights that they're getting out of their data. The other one is not equipped to act on the insights. And so I, I met with a company, I was um, meeting with them, and we were talking to different parts of their operations and one thing that came up repeatedly was how hard it was for them to make changes to their website. Their, their back-end systems were basically impossible to work with. And so one team said, yeah, it took us three months to, to make a change to the website. And then the next team said four months, and then six months, and then we're actually meeting with the last guy. And then he said nine months. And I was like, what? And what it was was, they had, uh, in, in Europe, they had a checkout process and they had some kind of um, like a bill me now kind of feature and it took them out to another website and then came back. But what happened is when they went out to the other partner website and came back into the shopping cart, guess where all the products in their shopping cart were? Not in their shopping cart. They basically deleted all the items in their shopping cart and they were basically forcing the customer to go back and re-add, rebuild their, their shopping cart. It took them nine months to fix that. How many companies would do take the same approach with their physical store? If you think of Home Depot or you think of Best Buy, how many would say, well, we're just gonna leave that cash register for nine months, we're not gonna fix it, you know, no problem, we'll just get people to line up. Maybe some people will leave because they get tired of waiting or you know, whatever, customer service is not as good. We wouldn't accept that in the physical world. Why do we accept that in the online world? And so value comes from knocking over that last domino we need to be data driven. We need to make sure we're lining up these data, these different steps. We need to be both data driven and action agile. And my hope is that you guys can be at analytics action heroes in your, in your world as well. Thank you for your time. We probably have a little bit of time for questions. If anybody has any questions, or you can come up to me and, and ask me questions one on one. Um, thank you for your time. Thank you. Any questions? Great, no questions. <laughs>